Welcome to History Where It Happened. Today we're in beautiful Plymouth Notch, Vermont. We're on the state historical spot of the birthplace of Calvin Coolidge. And we're privileged today to have uh, Bill Jenny, who is the site administrator, give us some comments about uh, all the beautiful buildings around here, the history involved with them, and everything involved with Coolidge. Bill, thank you very much for Oh, our spending, pleasure. Spending the time. This is absolutely gorgeous. Well, it is a beautiful spring day, uh, just about a week before we officially open for the season. And uh, we have a lot of here for folks to see. Uh, this town is preserved virtually as it was in Coolidge's time. All the buildings are in their original locations, and many of them have their contents intact from the 1920s. So this has been called one of the best preserved presidential sites in the country. What are some of these buildings? This, uh, this is your office over there now. but The uh, building right across from the general store and post office is known as the Aldrich House, and that originally was the home of Plymouth's first cheesemaker, Eugene Aldridge, and was actually his daughter's house for most of the 1900s. Uh, Miss Aldridge moved there as a little girl in 1902 and died in 1991 at the age of 99. Is that the one they call Midge? Midge, okay. right. And she was a tiny little thing. And she <laughs> operated a tea room and gift shop in there in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it was quite an operation, uh, sometimes making upwards of $200 a day. And literally thousands of people were visiting Plymouth Notch at that time. And so these little businesses sprung up overnight to accommodate all these people, someone had to feed them and supply them with souvenirs and so forth. And so uh, the Aldridge House is a wonderful example of what we call continuous New England architecture, where the sheds and the barns were gradually added on over the years. Out in the back to the right are three little cabins, and they were set up in 1927 to house the Secret Service agents. And the little souvenir stand in front by the road uh, was put up also that year. And that was a, basically a small gift shop uh, to keep Midge's father out of trouble. He was the cheesemaker, but uh, <laughs> he had retired by that time. So he needed something to do. So he had a mini version of what uh, his daughter was offering in the main shop in the house itself. Now, were, were those made, were those cottages made here? They were prefabs, they a little actually, oh, prefab. and they were purchased from a firm down in the Boston area and shipped flat and assembled on the spot. And we have the middle one opened as a museum, and it has, again, its original furnishings in there. And the other two have been modernized on the inside, so we use those for our graduate students for housing during the summertime. What are these two buildings? One is the barn. The, uh... the two barns um, across the road are known as the Wilder Barns, and they went with the Wilder House, which is uh, directly across the street from here. The Wilder House uh, built about 1840 as an inn, and uh, that was Calvin's mother's family home. And it was quite a large farm. They had uh, most of their acreage going towards the mountain, and the two barns uh, on here, on the left, the one is 1875 circa, houses uh, one of the region's best collections of late 19th century agricultural equipment. The smaller barn, which looks a little newer, uh, is because it is newer. Um, that is the only reconstructed building here at the Notch. Uh, that was the only one missing from the village. It had fallen down in the early 1940s, years before the state began acquiring properties here. And fortunately, because of the fame of the town, every angle of that building had been photographed, so we were able to reproduce it exactly by counting the number of boards and battens across. We were able to determine the location of the windows and the doors and so forth. Originally, it was a horse barn, and so we thought it appropriate that it now has our horse-drawn vehicles. It also has a horseless carriage in there. There's a 1923 Model T Ford that we have on display, and that actually is on loan from our maintenance man. <laughs> and I think his wife was kind of happy to get it out of the garage, and so now it's down here. But it's very uh, typical type of uh, automobile that uh, most folks would be able to afford in that time. Not a real fancy Packard or one of those, but uh, this uh, was purchased for about $600 in 1923. That was a, a curious comment, and this is where I'm going to show my ignorance of Calvin Coolidge, but 
You mentioned that was his mother's house over here. But when his mother died, he, Calvin Coolidge's father, remarried. And wasn't that woman also from? Plymouth Notch. Plymouth Notch. And actually, the Aldridge house was her home originally. Ah. And so uh, Calvin uh, was very fond of his stepmother. Uh, she was his school teacher here at Plymouth Notch. And so uh, he addressed her as mother uh, for the rest of her life. She died in 1920, um, knew that he was being considered for the vice presidential slot, but didn't see that happen. Yeah. And where are we now? We're on the front porch of the Florence Silly General Store. And the uh, name uh, changed over the years depending on the owners. This right. was originally Calvin's father's general store. And uh, he employed Calvin in here uh, on school vacations and so forth. And in fact, one winter, Calvin was too ill to begin college, so his father put him to work in the store. And they remodeled the place at that time. So they put in the counters and the shelving, and then they remodeled upstairs from a loft into the community dance hall. So I guess he wasn't too ill to do all of that. <laughs> but uh, then uh, in 1917, Calvin's father, who still owned the building, sold it to this Florence Silly, C-I-L-L-E-Y. And uh, so because of our primary interpretive years are 1923, when Coolidge was sworn in as president here, and 1924, when he had his summer White House here, we keep her name above the front door because that would be appropriate to that particular time period. If, if you have the time, is there any chance we could just take a quick look? Of and... course, let's go in. So these are the counters that Calvin and his father made in 1890. It's a beautiful combination of bird's eye maple and cherry. Now that uh, sort of wood was reserved usually for fine furniture in northern New England. So this was quite exceptional, and in fact, the uh, paper over in Woodstock mentioned the fact that John Coolidge's store was reopening and that folks should come over to see the counters because they were particularly fine. The shelves behind, again, were built by Calvin and his father, and uh, this is one of our museum stores during the season, so we carry merchandise in here that evokes an early 20th century store with the old-fashioned toys and the Vermont food products, of course, Moxie. Penny, candy, Moxie. Moxie. Moxie was Calvin's favorite soft drink, so that's pretty much, uh, we have to have it. And uh, if uh, you've never had it before, it's um, kind of an interesting combination of flavors. Uh, <laughs> I often say it's an acquired taste. Some <laughs> folks absolutely love it, and some don't, but we sell an awful lot of it during the season. I like it. I'm just trying to date this now. If, if this was, you said this was 1890, the uh, counter. Right. So Calvin would have been a young teenager, 18 or something. Just about, yes. Yeah. And uh, so he delayed his entrance into Amherst College by that year because he did have a, a very severe cold that fall. So that's why he was home <coughs> and then uh, entered Amherst the following year after attending uh, St. Johnsbury Academy for a couple of months to build up his credentials. Uh, while we're right here, we can uh, look at the post office that served the town of Plymouth until 1976, believe it or not. And at that point, uh, the town started growing again with the addition of Hawk Mountain Resort, which is a few miles down the road. And so the post service needed a larger space. So they moved to the other side of that wall here. And as far as we know, it's the only example of the US Postal Service renting their space from a state because, of course, these are all state-owned buildings. But nice to have the continuance of this post office being in here since it has been located here since 1855. Now, is Plymouth Notch is, is a village within the town. The town. Mm -hmm. So the post office here is Plymouth. Right. And so uh, Plymouth Notch was one of 17 different villages in the town of Plymouth at one point, and each village had its own one-room school. The height of the population was in the mid-1800s, and so after the Civil War and the guys had gone off and seen literally greener, more rock-free pastures elsewhere, a lot of the population of Vermont left. And so uh, most of the villages of Plymouth uh, went back to forest. And in fact, there's basically only three that are left, 
Plymouth Notch, which of course is mostly a museum complex, right. Plymouth Union down at the bottom of the hill, which is where the town clerk is and so forth, and then Tyson, which is a few miles south. So Plymouth was a very big town in territory, still is, but Plymouth Notch was always the historic center of the town because it's where the post office was. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So welcome to Coolidge uh, Hall. It's a great space. Oh, this is fabulous. And this uh, served primarily as a dance hall for the community, but it was the only space large enough for Calvin Coolidge's office when he was here in 1924. So it's kind of neat to think that the entire country was being run from this room with a staff of two people. How long was he here for this? When they he say was summer? here that summer for 12 days. This was shortly after the death of his younger son, Calvin Jr. Oh, right, and so right. he was in mourning during that time and was anxious to get back to Washington to get back to work. Uh -huh. Usually the summer White Houses were three months in duration. Um, in those days, both the President and the Congress left Washington because it was so hot and humid for 12 weeks. But of course, government didn't completely shut down and things right. had to be taken care of. And one of the items on his agenda that particular summer, 1924, was trying to decide what to do about the KKK, which was a huge problem. And it may explain why he had such a large Secret Service detachment with him. He had 18 agents here, which was the largest detachment ever assigned to a summer White House. And so they were watching him very closely. I read, I read somewhere, uh that the KKK actually declined a lot during his administration. It did, uh, yeah. shortly after that time. Yeah. But uh, it was of concern, and there were Vermont chapters. And sure, sure. It uh, is a very difficult area to protect because this uh, village is in a bowl surrounded by hillsides. And it may explain, too, why we haven't had another sitting president here visiting. Now, again, this room is complete with all its original furniture. The Tables here were made especially for Calvin for his use that particular summer. The instruments of the Plymouth Old Time Dance Orchestra are all here, and they uh, performed music of the 1880s time period. They went on a national tour in 1926 as kind of a, a almost like a vaudeville intermission thing at uh, big movie theaters. And they were all friends or even relatives of Calvin, so they were quite famous, and they ended up their tour at the White House. And so um, we, in the course of doing this little display in this uh, room, found an article in the New York Times that talks about this grand tour of the Plymouth Old Time Dance Orchestra. And the first line is, half of the president's hometown visits him at the White House. And then it goes through a whole explanation of what this group was. And then the last line is, the village consists of 29 inhabitants. <laughs> so in other words, there were 14 people who descended on the White House, House. that day. If you didn't know any better, of course, you're thinking thousands, right? So that's kind of amusing. This is, this is my kind of history. I really love the, the original. You know, this is where it happened, right, right. here. And uh, that's true of the entire village. You really can get the feeling of going back in time when you're walking down the street. And in fact, I kind of liken it to Vermont's Brigadoon. You uh, have that feeling of uh, the old days when you come here. The only thing that was missing from the whole room was the snowy owl that's up there on the uh, shelf. And uh, being that it was an old stuffed bird, it was ditched at some point, and we thought it was important to get it back because not only is it in photographs of this room, but it was a symbol for Calvin Coolidge. The snowy owl was his fraternity mascot, Phi Gamma Delta. And uh, this one happened to be killed by a car and was in the freezer up at the Fish and Wildlife Department. And uh, it took us about six months of clearing red tape to get permission to display this because, of course, it's a but that's endangered the original? species. That's no, this is a, a new specimen. A new specimen. And, uh, the same but we have there. a little disclaimer on the wall over there saying that we do not encourage people to collect such things. It really is, uh, you need a scientific sign collection of, permit. Yeah. Sign of the times. Right. Oh, that is, it's also hard for me, to, you know, I'm trying to envision the times of 
Calvin Coolidge was the Roaring Twenties. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was all flappers, dancing, prohibition, right. and so, the whole, and, and look at this. This, right. is this was so throwback. unusual for most Americans, and that's why they were coming here in droves. Um, this was unusual to find a town where people were basically living as they had more than 100 years before that. No electricity, no plumbing in the buildings, and so it was um, quaint for most people, uh, from the city certainly, you know, and they had all the modern conveniences, many we have now, of course. This uh, sign here is kind of interesting. This um, was put up by the hometown Coolidge Club that was set up to raise funds for the president's campaign in 1924. See, he was Vice President Coolidge and was up here visiting his family working on the farm when word came that the president, Warren Harding, had died. And they had to swear him in immediately and the only available official happened to be Calvin's father who administered the oath in his capacity as a notary public. Well, Calvin served the last year of Harding's term, but ran again in his own right the following year, in uh, 1924. And this hometown Coolidge Club uh, had raised something like $12,000 by the spring of 1924. And here you can see the sign on the post out in front of the Silly store. And this is Florence Silly here, and maybe folks would recognize the fellow standing next to him. Do you have any idea? Will Rogers. Will Rogers, Oklahoma. Yes. And yeah. so he came up here in uh, 1925, the following year. And uh, he and Calvin uh, got along very well because of their shared sense of humor. And in fact, uh, Coolidge is often depicted as an old sourpuss, but that couldn't be further from the truth. There's a uh, book out that's uh, just fairly recently by Senator Bob Dole, all about presidential humor, and he ranks Calvin Coolidge as one of the funniest presidents that we've ever had. It's just that it was this dry Vermont wit, and you really had to pay attention and wouldn't realize that uh, he was uh, not being serious. And in fact, uh, half the time he was poking fun at the people down in Washington. They didn't have a clue. When did the silent cow image uh, develop? Was well, that, that came up as early as I when think he was in Massachusetts the 1910s or, or so. Okay. And uh, it, this kind of fell into place uh, with the number thing, Keep Cool and Keep Coolidge. Uh, that was his slogan in 1924, basically implying that everything is going so well, why change anything? But the silent cow was um, pretty much a misnomer because if you got him on certain topics, he could go on and on. And in fact, um, he uh, gave more speeches than all 29 presidents before him. He wrote most of them himself. He didn't have a professional speech writer. And so when Calvin Coolidge talked, those were his own words. And uh, he gave, on the average, two press conferences a week, which is more than any president has ever done. So that's up over. 500, it must be. I right, remember. and of course it was a different day and age. Yeah. And in those days, the reporters would submit written questions and it was up to Calvin Coolidge if he was going to respond to them or not. It was just a different kind of etiquette. And then uh, someone even calculated, he said more than 8,000 words a month on the radio. And so he was the talkative president in many ways, but he wasn't into the dinner party chit chat scene and that's where he got this silent cow business. There's a famous story um, that we think is true. As vice president, he often had to go to dinner parties as part of his obligations. And he was once seated next to a woman who told him that she had a bet with someone that she could get him to say more than two words during the dinner. And his response was, you lose. <laughs> and that was it. And so she lost the bet. <laughs> That's great. That was, again, his sense of humor more than anything else. <laughs> I want them to have the rewards of their own industry. This is the chief meaning of freedom. Until we can reestablish a condition under which the earnings of the people can be kept by the people, we are bound to suffer a very severe and distinct curtailment of our liberty. So we're walking down the street here in Plymouth Notch, and first building that you come to is 
why everyone comes to Plymouth these days. This is the birthplace of Calvin Coolidge. This little house attached to the back of the general store. It was logical for the family to start out here because Calvin's father operated the store at this period. It's a very uh, modest dwelling and the press was very quick to pick up on this and there were comparisons made to Coolidge's famous Republican predecessor born in a log cabin. The uh, building is not a log cabin, but it is simple and it has all its original furniture in there, including the bed in which he was born and so forth. That's great. He lived here until he was four years old and at that point his sister was born and so this little house began to get a bit cramped for the growing family and so that's when they moved to the big white house just across the road, which we know as the Coolidge Homestead. The Union Christian Church was a congregational church built in 1840 in the Greek Revival style. A lot of buildings, public buildings in the United States were basically inspired by the Grecian democracies and so that's why this is more or less a Greek temple. The interior was remodeled in the 1890s in what is called Carpenter Gothic style and it's considered one of the finest examples of that style of architecture in the country. Uh, the acoustics in there are perfect. Uh, it is still used uh, for an occasional wedding and so forth, and that is owned by the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. So this was built in 1890? 1840. 1840, so Cal that would have been Calvin Coolidge's church, or at least visited. Right. right, if it was too cold to have service and the congregation would move over across the road to the Coolidge Homestead. The Coolidge Homestead, is preserved virtually as it was in 1923. And that, of course, was again the year when Coolidge was sworn in as president. He was uh, administered the presidential oath of office in the first floor bay window right went in that room there. And as uh, people can go through this building, they will see the tables and the chairs and the pots and the pans and the places they've been in for now 90 plus years. I was largely the Coolidge's housekeeper who was family for, oh, 50 years, and uh, she never let them make any changes. She wasn't family. She was hired help, basically, but she ran the place, and they didn't dare do any changes without her approval. And in fact, um, they didn't do anything with the building until after she died. It was following uh, Grace Coolidge's wish that John Coolidge donated this building and its contents to the state of Vermont back in 1956. And so at that time it was open to the public and uh, again, literally thousands of people come every year to check this out. Uh, this is a, a remarkable time capsule of the era. Well, wasn't there something too, he was um, inaugurated, it was early in the morning or there was something and there was, wasn't there a question about uh, his father was not a, I always think of uh, Supreme Court justices. Right, well usually of course. Justice of the Supreme Court that administers the presidential oath, but in this case, of course, that type of person was not available. And so uh, they called Washington to find out uh, whether Calvin's father could administer the oath in his capacity as a notary public. Yeah. And the attorney general said yes, swear him in immediately, and so they did so. But a little known fact is that there was a second ceremony when they returned to Washington with a federal judge, just to make sure. Double, double check. Right, because there was some debate as official could administer a federal oath. So, so this was his home from 18, let's see, 1872 he was born. He moved four, here when he was years, four. Four years. Uh, he went away to school. Right, so he grew up here. This was his boyhood home and where he returned all those summers throughout his life um, to help out on the family farm. Um, even when the summer White House locations were elsewhere, he would still vacation shortly here. So he was very, very attached to his home state. Where, where did he live when uh, he went down to Ludlow? He went down to the... Well, he stayed at boarding houses down the there, sometimes houses. with distant relatives, cousins, and so forth. And uh, then he would come back here weekends. Yeah, this is only, what, from Ludlow? What were we? 12, 12 miles, 12 miles 12, right. 12 miles, yeah. And that's probably the way, I mean, this hasn't been added on to or anything. This is the way it was. This is the way it was. Uh, the most recent thing that we did was to replace the roof. Originally, this house would have had a wood shingle roof. 
But in 1925, um, a company donated asbestos cement tiles to put on the roof to uh, protect the National Shrine from fire. And so that was a donation actually to Calvin's father. This was his house at that point. And uh, so we removed that asbestos cement tile um, just a few years ago and put on a slate instead of the exact same color. So a lot of people don't realize that that's what, what we did. But uh, that was the most recent thing that has been done in this building. You really, I mean, just standing here, you really appreciate uh, your description of, of where he was born and here. It had to have affected his whole life when you're being frugal and a fiscal conservative and uh, living within your means and, uh, you know, nothing extravagant. And this was the rural, not rural, roaring 20s. Mm -hmm. He was very fiscally conscious and uh, he was asked when he left the presidency what his greatest accomplishment was, and uh, he said his handling of the economy. Of course, during the Coolidge years, uh, this country was thriving, and most people were making lots of money, doing very well. And uh, so while he was president, he was able to reduce the national debt, and uh, he uh, was famous for his tax cuts, but they were favoring the lower and the middle classes. And so by the time he was finished, about 98% of Americans were paying no federal income tax. And so uh, it was only after he left, it was several months later and during the Hoover administration, that things kind of fell apart during uh, the stock market crash and so forth. Of course, Hoover was his Secretary of Commerce. That's correct. So he, I read a real, you're talking about your the quote, I, real funny thing that he said, uh, talk about his wit, you were talking about his wit, he said something about, he didn't know whether to support Hoover or not, and then they said something that he, um, he said, well, I don't know, Hoover, that man, that man has been giving me advice for six years, all of it bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But he did, he did support. Uh, I mean, yes, yeah, so and that was his last official speech uh, when he was, uh, in 1932, he gave a speech at Madison Square Garden to support Herbert Hoover's uh, run for nomination. nomination. Well, just one last question, Bill. I had a question about the uh, Plymouth Cheese House. The uh, Cheese Factory was established in 1890 by Calvin's father and four other farmers who uh, used it as an outlet for their milk supply being uh, for refrigeration not so reliable in those days. It was better to turn your milk into cheese. And so this was shipped all over the Northeast, was very well known in its time, and operated until the 1930s, at which time it uh, closed because of a uh, change in milk storage laws here in depression. Vermont. And the and depression. depression. And so then uh, it was revived again in 1960 by John Coolidge, the son of the president and he operated it until 1998, at which time we bought it from him. So uh, we own the building, uh, the state, and uh, all the equipment, but lease out the business. And the fellows who are operating it now, uh, Jesse Werner is the cheesemaker, and he's doing a terrific job in recreating this original Plymouth cheese. It's a granular curd cheese, which is something like cheddar, only a little looser and moister in texture. And the technique actually goes back to the 1600s here in this country. It's a farmer's cheese, as they called it. And the uh, flavors are very tasty, and uh, they have developed also a blue cheese, which they call red, white, and blue, which is kind of <laughs> clever. Symbolic. And there's another variety of the Plymouth cheese called Grace's Choice, and that, of course, is uh, based on Grace Coolidge, Calvin's wife who was beloved and uh, she is actually the subject of our temporary exhibit this year. Uh, we're going to be looking at her fashion. Uh, she was one of the finest dressed first ladies and that was Calvin's one fiscal weakness was to keep her, his wife in beautiful clothes. And so those will be on display in our museum and education center. And that's also where we have a really nice interpretive exhibit permanent that uh, examines Coolidge's life and legacy, and that actually won an award from the American Association for State and Local History. Has a lot of computer interactives and flip books and things like that that uh, kids really enjoy. I, I, mu I must admit, I've been in there, and it's absolutely fabulous. If you have families, bring them here, because you can, you can talk to Calvin Coolidge. They've got, uh, what, news, newsreels? Uh, 
a history of his life here, his life in uh, Massachusetts when he became governor, and and of course everything that happened here. So, right, and the site is open every day from May 23rd through October 18, and uh, we suggest that uh, folks allow at least two hours when they visit because there is so much to see. There are 13 buildings on the tour now. We have two walking trails. One goes out on the hillside in this direction, and one is out over by East Mountain, and uh, we have three stores on site, an uh, on-site restaurant which makes a wonderful uh, breakfast and lunch with homemade sandwiches and soups and so forth. So there's a lot to do when you come to visit. That's great. We draw our presidents from the people. It is a wholesome thing for them to return to the people. I came from them. I wish to be one of them again. Those words you heard were a quote from Calvin Coolidge's autobiography. You can tell his desire. He wanted to be buried with the people, and we are now here in the Plymouth Town Cemetery. Uh, it's very humble. There's no mausoleum here. Uh, there's no big signs or anything else for the Calvin Coolidge uh, burial site. This is Calvin Coolidge's grave right here. Calvin Coolidge, July 4th, 1872. He died, oh, he was the only president to be born on uh, the 4th of July. He died January 5th, 1933. He died in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, and then he was brought back here. His son, Calvin Coolidge Jr., was born 1908 and died in 1924. He only lived to be about 16. He got an infection from playing tennis at the White House and ended up dying. And it was the first time a son of a sitting president had died since uh, Abraham Lincoln's son, I believe it was Willie, died in the early 1860s in the, in the White House. Over here is Calvin Coolidge's wife, Grace Goodhue. Calvin and, um, Calvin and Grace were married up in Burlington. She died in 1957. She died about um, when she was 78. Calvin died when he was about 60. She was the vivacious, lively one, almost a counterpart to Calvin Coolidge. Uh, she was known for uh, being a nice entertainer, easy to get along with. She was also a Phi Beta Kappa and so on. She went to the University of Vermont. John Coolidge was their other son. John Coolidge died in 2000. John Coolidge was a big benefactor, big supporter of this historic site here in, uh, here in Plymouth, Vermont. He gave some buildings, he started the cheese company, he was very, very supportive. He died in 2000 and he lived to be about 93. So he lived to be 93 and the younger son, the other son, only 16 years old. Now down here, these are all Coolidge's. This Coolidge grave is very interesting. This is John C. Coolidge, we call him Colonel. That was Calvin Coolidge's father. And he died in 1926 when Calvin was still in the White House. His first wife, Victoria Moore, died in 1885. Calvin was born in 1872. So Calvin was only 12 or 13 when his his biological natural mother died. John Coolidge remarried Carrie Brown, who was a school teacher here in Plymouth, and she died in 1920. The last name down here is Abigail. Abigail was the daughter of Victoria and John Coolidge. Abigail was Calvin Coolidge's sister, and she died in 1890, so Abigail, Calvin Coolidge's sister died when uh, Calvin was only about 18. It's interesting, they're all in the same uh, cemetery plot here. Right here, some of these are 1860, died in uh, 1860. It's interesting here, this John Coolidge had a spelling difference. 
And that's very common in the old days. Uh, some uh, record of various people being spelled with uh, the Coolidge's with the name E. This is also Luther Coolidge, died 1865 at 74. So he was born in the 1700s. Same here. 18, died in 1856. Uh, 74 years old, so again, it's the 1700s. And looking down here, seven generations of Coolidge's in this entire cemetery. Well, before we close uh, this episode on Calvin Coolidge, I thought it very appropriate. We're ca we came down here to Bennington. Calvin Coolidge had other ties uh, to Vermont besides uh, Plymouth. One of them was Burlington, of course, where his wife was from. But more important, a famous speech he made here in Bennington uh, in 1928. In 1927 was the 1927 flood, which was famous here in Vermont. And Calvin Coolidge, as president, toured Vermont. He came down here to the Bennington station. And you know, Silent Cal never made speeches. And all of a sudden, he walked to the back of the train and made a speech. And that speech. Uh, was so impromptu that uh, a lot of the reporters didn't have pencil and paper and they were surprised, but he made it extemporaneously. But I just want to read the last four sentences. These four sentences of that speech are famous and they're inscribed in the uh, Vermont State House. I love Vermont because of her hills and valleys, her scenery and invigorating climate, but most of all because of her, her indomitable people. They are a race of pioneers who have almost beggared themselves to serve others. If the spirit of liberty should vanish in other parts of the Union and support of our institutions should languish, it could all be replenished from the generous store held by the, the people of this brave little state. And as I said, those four words, uh, excuse me, those four lines are inscribed in the Vermont State House. Well, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this episode. I want to thank Bill Jenny of the uh, Coolidge Homestead for helping us and showing us around. And I hope you enjoy it. I hope you visit um, Plymouth and tour the Coolidge home site. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>